Have you ever seen the wonder in the earth's second light? Having come out of the waters with your beloved behind. morning, Calvary Church. I'm going to invite you to stand with us. We're going to sing to our great King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's do that together now. Oh, we trust the name of Jesus. 
lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. Let's sing that out together. Here we go. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From A to A to A. Your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From Amen. Amen. It's great to be here together, worshiping our God, lifting high the name of Jesus. My name is George May. I'm pastor of Counseling and Family Ministries here, and I want to welcome you here this morning. Welcoming all of you, but especially those of you who may be new among us. If this is uh, one of your first times here at Calvary, We just love to get to know you a little bit, and that's a little bit difficult to do in this large room. But right after this service, we have what's called the welcome gathering. It's about 10 minutes of your time, gives us a chance to get to know you, answer any of your questions about Calvary Church. You'd head out the back doors, turn right all the way down to the end of the lobby, and uh, there will be some pastors and volunteers to meet you there and, and get to know you. So we look forward to seeing you there. And if you're staying, if you have the opportunity to stay around, we also have lunch that's served at the end of this hour as well. Join us over in Fellowship Hall. It's a great time to get to know some other people and uh, to fellowship with those that are part of our church family here. Another thing I want to call your attention to is that uh, on September 10th, we'll be having our annual meeting a meeting for the family of Calvary Church. We just want to update you on some things that are going on here at Calvary. And uh, we also have some things that we'll actually need to vote on. So if you're a member, uh, please be present. Uh, In the coming weeks, you'll see some things in your bulletin that will uh, give you more information about that and more information will be coming to you related to those voting items. But it'll be a great time of you getting updated on what's going on here at Calvary. And you don't have to be a member to come. If you consider Calvary Church your, your home, please come. Be a part of that. We'd, we'd love to have that. Uh, in addition to information about the annual meeting in the bulletin, there's a lot of other very important announcements. would really encourage you to read that through. You'll also find a paper that gives you some updates on a few of our global partners, Roy and Debbie Hodson and Andy and Lori Keener. Uh, great updates on them. So... As we look to uh, join together and worship the Lord through music, through communion, and through hearing and responding to the word of God, let's, let's look to the Lord in prayer. God, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather together in freedom, to worship you, to hear from your word, to be able to respond to your word and keep growing. God, this is just such a privilege to be here. And we're grateful. As we enter into your word, we invite you to teach us. As we take communion, we ask that you would search us. Help us to recognize areas of growth, that you would reaffirm the fullness of your grace and forgiveness to us. And as we worship you in song, that you would just free our hearts to worship well. God, we think of Andy and Lori Keener thanking you for the 25 years they have served communities without scripture. 
through a variety of strategies to get scripture into their own heart language. And as Andy and Lori are serving more and more in leadership and equipping others, just continue to use them in significant ways. And God, we pray too for Roy and Debbie Hodson. After many decades as director of Scripture Memory Mountain Mission, as, as they transition out of that directorship, we just pray that you would identify the right person to transition in and that you would give Roy and Debbie wisdom for the next steps ahead. And God, we're grateful for how you use all of us from day to day, from week to week. Give us eyes to see those around us that we can reach out to, those that need your care, those that need to hear about your grace, your salvation. Help us to live out who you are in our church family, in our workplace, in our neighborhoods. We're just grateful for that opportunity. So we thank you for what you'll do. And we, uh, we look forward to seeing you, your continued work in our lives. And we give you the thanks for it and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> We're gonna worship through giving.
Jesus, we lift you and you alone up. Your name and your name only is great because you have defeated sin and death. You have conquered the grave and through that we have new life in you. And so we praise you this morning. We give you all the glory. We love you and we thank you because you first loved us. And we pray this all in your awesome name, Jesus. Amen. You can have a seat.
We all want to be free, really free, in every aspect of life. But sometimes we are enslaved to warped thinking, dominating passions, and relentless guilt. Freedom's there for the taking in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why not take it? Paul's letter to the Galatians is our guide to breaking free of all that's entangling us and bringing us down. Let's embrace the gospel, all of it, and get fully and finally freed up. morning. We are continuing in our summer series entitled Freed Up, Paul's letter to the Galatians. And we're considering what does it look like for, for anyone, Christ follower or not, to, to live in a way that's freed up, freed up from legalism and freed up from uh, even uh, the sin that seeks to enslave and entrap us. And we're continuing that discussion this morning. Uh, my name is Scott Messner, and I'm part of the staff here at Calvary Church. And I want to make a commitment to you this morning Because I know around this country, and with good reason, there will be a lot of pastoral banter, humor, all alluding to an eclipse. And my commitment to you is to do none of that. So for those who love sort of what I call the pastoral banter, apologies. But for those like me that kind of feel like that gets a little cheesy sometimes, you're welcome. I also need to start off right away this morning making something very, very clear. Uh, When this series first got printed in your bulletin, at the very back page of your bulletin, you'll see the entire series listed in the titles and the scriptures used for each week. And I'm sure there is at least one person in this entire congregation who saw that there was the same verses listed this week as next week. And maybe some of you were like, who's editing this thing? Who's writing this thing? They didn't know. This is like such an, a critical piece. And others maybe thought, well, maybe, maybe they tried that. And, and in fact, it wasn't a mistake. It was intentional. We're preaching on the same portion of Scripture both this week and next week, which for some of you probably seems odd because there's certain weeks we cover entire chapters in one week. And so that begs an even bigger question for me this morning. I want to give you a couple of theories I have. Why would we choose to preach on the same scripture portion two weeks in a row? Well, one idea I have, this is just a theory, but they figured we'll put Scott Messner up week one. He'll either do such a bad job or actually screw it up. Let's make sure we follow again second week and that somebody can kind of clean up his mess. Another option, preaching like really anything in life, it gets better, you know, with experience. You try something new for the very first time and usually you're not so good at it. So I have a concern that they figured we'll put Messner up week one. Whoever follows week two is going to just sound so much better, which they probably will, but I'll do my very best. Now, option three, and this is the option that actually I'm most terrified about and I'm actually most, the most concerned about. Uh, option three goes something like this. I'm a little nervous about this because I think in in this position, the men who stand here in my place throughout the summer, they're experts in their field of study. They are experts who have taught at seminary level. They have doctoral degrees in preaching. They're literal experts in the topic matter. And my concern is, how, how am I viewed on staff? Because we're gonna be reading a portion of scripture this morning that includes words like sorcery, envy, strife, And like anger, fits of anger. So I'm concerned that they, whoever the they are, they were sitting in a meeting and they're thinking, now who is our expert on things like this? Who within our staff understands these things? I'm hoping it was a long conversation. I hope it wasn't like an instantaneous, like Scott Messner, he's our guy. But some way or another, they've arrived this morning and thinking, well, Scott Messner, he, he, uh, he gets that stuff. Let's ask him. Let me level with you. The real truthful answer is that this is such an important piece of Scripture. This portion of Scripture has so much to say to each one of us about what does it mean to live in the freedom Christ offers us. What does it mean to not be enslaved by sin or by religiosity or legalism, but to truly live in the freedom Christ offers Let me pray before we go any further, and then we'll move along. Father, thank you for this morning. 
Lord, would you help each one of us to be led by your spirit this morning? You, you brought us all here for one reason or another. So use this morning, use this text of scripture uh, to change us, to challenge us, convict us, and to comfort us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. This week, the title of the sermon is Free Reign, and, and it's really the question of what does it look like when we allow sin to have free reign in our lives? And, and sometimes the world kind of encourages it, but ultimately it enslaves and entraps us. So what does it look like to move towards freedom? I wonder this question, though. Do any of you deal with low-grade guilt? Maybe some of you would say, no, it's more of a medium to high-grade guilt. But my guilt stems from many different things. One of the areas that I, it comes from is just my constant struggle with saying yes to certain things inevitably means a no to something else. And like I want to be all things for all people and my family and my workplace and even my neighborhood. Like there's things that they're going through that I wish I could just spend more time with. I have friends who I know are going through difficult seasons and I just can't be there as much as I'd like to be there for them. And it ends up kind of causing in me this sort of constant like, ah, I'm just letting people down. Like no matter what I do or where I go, it just seems like there's just not enough of me and I can't prioritize right because I, I'm just not able to do it all. Other times, my guilt stems from just where I am in my life. Like, I should be further along in my spiritual journey. I should be further along in understanding what it means to live a life of love and mercy and grace. And I do dumb things throughout the days and weeks that I'm like, I've been at this following Christ thing for far too long to still be kind of messed up with that issue. Other times, my guilt stems from actual sin. Not just, like, thinking about sin or not just leaving people down, but actually committing sin, messing up, and, and realizing, like, I simply can't beat it on my own power and strength. And there's this temptation, and there's this thing that pulls me this one way, and then I do do it. I, I fall from time to time, and I take steps backwards. Maybe it's guilt, but maybe it's not. Maybe for you, it's, it's indifference towards sin. I go through seasons of my life where most of the time I, I'm kind of a guilt-ridden guy, but there is times and seasons where I'm just indifferent. Like, I know there's probably things I'm doing, but if somebody were to ask me in these seasons, like, hey, Scott, what are you struggling with right now? Like, what kinds of things are, are you having to battle? And during these seasons, I, I don't know, I'm pretty good, and I think everything is good. Like, what a ridiculous answer. Like, I somehow have, like, came to the top, and I'm like, I'm pretty much perfect now. I think some of us rationalize these seasons of our lives. We think, well, I'm not as bad as that person, and I'm doing better than that person over here. And if you only knew some of the people I worked with or talked to throughout my week, then you would, you would really see some bad people. And I always think to myself, the stakes are so high when I bend this direction. Because God has given me such opportunity each and every day, and the more I bend into indifference towards sin in my life, I think the less opportunity there is for the kingdom of God and all its mercy and grace and love to be demonstrated through me because I'm wrapped up in my own selfishness. So we're going to dive in this morning into a text that, that talks to both of these audiences, those who are struggling with the guilt of sin and those who are struggling with the indifference of sin, thinking, well, my sin is just not that big a deal. Galatians 5, 16 to 26, if you have your devices, uh, the Bible's in the pew, page 975. Starting in verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit. That's something we hear from time to time. People say, I want to be Spirit-led. I want to be Spirit-driven. What does it mean? Well, give me, let me give you just a, a working definition that I've come up with. It's living yielded to the Spirit, recognizing that the Spirit inside of us, the very Spirit of God, convicts us, prompts us, challenges us, moves us, it's sort of like the, the dashboard indicator on your car that like lights up from time to time, that you know something's happening. And, and in that moment, as soon as the light flashes, do you choose to yield to the Spirit or do you just say, no, I'm going to ignore the Spirit because I actually want to just do whatever I want to do? Last week, we looked at the idea of freedom and we said that freedom exists for faith working itself out in love to serve, that our freedom isn't about a, a license to sin, but an opportunity for each one of us to enter into the brokenness. 
which by the way, we've all seen the news and we know what's going on. There is so much brokenness. And the freedom that we have in Christ exists so that we have an opportunity to to enter into that brokenness, not that we can fix much of anything, but that we can point to the person who does and is able to enter into our lives. I love the concept of walk, but I say walk, meaning there's a process and there should be progress. I love the idea that no matter what age you're at, whether a child to later on in life, there is a journey, and it's a moment by moment, step by step, and it's not a sprint. It doesn't say, but I say, you know, get to a certain point and then coast. It doesn't say, you know, once you've gone to church enough, then you can kind of just relax because you've hit a certain point. And so it says pursue, and I love that it's not walking alone. Walk by the Spirit. On my own energy, and my own strength, my flesh tends to push me in the directions I don't want to go, but it says walk by the Spirit. Verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. You can see in your notes, this is some deep-rooted theology. I'm messed up, and so are you. There's this part of you motivated by the flesh that's in direct battle and conflict with this part of you that's the spirit for those who claim Christ. There is no middle ground. It isn't like Paul said, well, listen, you can walk by the flesh, but occasionally, particularly on Sunday mornings from 9 to 1230, kind of walk by the spirit, and then Monday morning comes and you can, no, it, it, it's a battle. They're diametrically opposed to one another. What I love about this concept is it creates in me a huge sense of humility when I relate to people. Because if I accept what Paul is saying, that there's this battle, that there's this thing inside of me that keeps me from doing the things I want to do, when I relate to people who are struggling, when I relate to people whose lives are messy, it isn't with sort of a a religious hypocrisy, but it's like, yeah, 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 like I have, like I'm messed up too. That except for Christ in me, there's no hope for me either. And because Christ is in me, things are different, but I still have this battle raging inside of me each and every day. The author of James says it this way. If you're thinking, well, where does this all come from? How do we battle this? James says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. By his own desire. Sometimes I want to blame the world. Sometimes we want to say, oh, it's, it's the things out there that's causing me to do this. By his own desire. It comes from within. First Peter says it this way. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your very soul. There is a struggle and there is a battle. There is the way of the flesh and the way of the spirit. And how is it that we begin to move towards walking in the spirit? That's what we want to think about. That's what we want to answer. That's the question we're looking to answer this morning for each one of our lives. But Paul doesn't answer the question immediately. He goes into a list. Now, some of you maybe are like me. I'm a list maker. I'm kind of militaristic about list making in the, in the way that like if something, if I just did two things and then I'm going to make a list, I'll sometimes write those two things down on the list just for the adrenaline rush that comes from making those lists, checking the box and crossing it out. It's like gets me fired up and started for the day. Sorry, like I, we're sick people, those of us like me that do that. But he's going to go to a list, and our, our tendency can, can be to say, oh, great, a list. So all I need to do is focus on not doing these things and then doing these things, and all will go well. That's what it means to walk in the Spirit, which is partially, partially true. Let me say a couple of things about the list. The list indicates things, but it doesn't do it in an exhaustive way. It's, it's a non-exhaustive list. These are some ways in which the flesh wars against our very lives. Some of us wonder, well, why, why law? You know, isn't freedom just all about doing whatever you want? In verse 19, it says, the works of the flesh are evident. 
they're evident because they have a negative impact. And that even our world will embrace some of these very works of the flesh, they tend to embrace them to a, to a specific point. Like you can be sexually immoral, our world says. But even for the world, there's a point where they will begin to condemn you in that pursuit. So it's all about freedom, but, but even they, who, who maybe say freedom is the greatest thing and just do whatever you want, say, no, some of these actually bring harm. They bring damage, they bring pain, they, they ruin families. And so even our world has a moral compass, which I think everyone has a moral compass, but everyone struggles with their moral compass. I think as a follower of Jesus, I'm just willing to admit, I don't trust my own compass. Like I need the spirit to guide and direct because I will cut corners, I will lie, I will try to look better. My own nervousness and guilt will cause me to say and do things that I almost am watching myself do it and thinking, what's wrong with you? And so the moral compass of God entering into my life through the spirit allows me to begin to walk by the spirit. Each one of these has a promise to fulfill even for a moment, but each one of these ends up enslaving us ends up boxing us in, ends, us, ends up with us having to become slaves to them. So that we're going to work through this list, but to do this list proper and to give it uh, the attention it needs, I need you to be a little bit selfish this morning. Uh, I think too many times when I sit in the pews, there's too many times where I think, oh, I'm glad so-and-so is here. I wish this person were here to hear this message because this person definitely is struggling with that. Like, I need us to look inside of ourselves a little bit and allow the Spirit to convict and to compel and to show us the areas where we are, are actually walking in the flesh and we've given over ourselves to the flesh. So the first one, sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. You can see it in your notes, my pleasure rather than God's purpose. Where is it that God has purposed certain things in our lives, but we have said, no, 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 even though God is a good and gracious Father, even though he knows what's best for me in my life, I'm gonna choose my own pleasure over and against whatever God has. It could look different in every area, but I think it's a constant struggle in the life of any believer that I'm choosing my pleasure, my ease, my comfort over and against God's purpose. The next one, idolatry and sorcery. My worship of something other than God? What are the things in my life that I'm elevating and making those primary instead of God? This one's incredibly difficult to work through, particularly the idolatry piece. I'm really convinced that you could bring up two different people who do the exact same occupation. One could be an absolute idolater and the other could be walking in the spirit. The only difference might be the motivational heart of what they do and why they do it. Uh, even when I think about our, our professions and how our professions can be our major and our primary identity rather than our identity in Christ. When work and success and family, and these are things that sometimes that, that we can be guilty of elevating to the point that only God should go. One of the struggles that I deal with as a young father is I want my kids to love God. I pray for them and I pray with them and I try to work with them. But even that, as noble as that can be, I believe can become idolatry. That I make it more about just my kids' faith than my own faith. And I say to my kids, oh, you gotta pursue God, pursue God, pursue God. And then I look at myself and I think, have, have, have I, am I living that out? Like, do, do I pursue God with that kind of passion and, and primacy and just, you know, abandonment? Or do am I just more concerned that my kids get it? Because in my line of work, it is, makes for awkward conversations if your kids end up being kind of bad people. The next one, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. These are hard ones. These are the relational ones. And the question is, my way, no matter the impact. I want what I want. These get tricky because I am always guilty of these things when it matters most to me. If we're talking about something that doesn't really matter to me, I don't have a lot of dissension. I don't have a lot of rivalry. I'm not looking to create arguments. But as soon as it's something that I care deeply about, 
a preference, a style, a way of doing something that I think, no, this, this has to be done this way. Then all of these things have a way of coming out. But notice what Paul doesn't say. He doesn't say enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, unless you're right. Like if you're right, then go ahead, go for it. He doesn't give us any license. He says, no, be freed from these things. You don't have to have any of these things in your life. You're not the judge, and you're, you may be right, but you need to really pursue the fruits of the Spirit rather than these things. I think sometimes I give myself license. Well, I, I, I'm right. So here we go. Let's, go, let's, let's, let's create rivalry. Let's, let's have some division. Let's have some dissension. The next one. Well, before we go on, Tim Keller says it this way. Sorry for the long quote, but I love what he says. This list, this relational list, this list written to religious people like us, this list shows us that God does not make the kind of distinctions that we do between sex and drunkenness and envy and selfish ambition. When we religious people look down at certain sins, Paul simply doesn't see it this way. In fact, he goes to much greater lengths. There's 15 total words on this list. He uses seven words to describe three categories and eight words to describe this relational religious category. I think Paul's trying to drive home a point to the church that when Jesus prayed for unity, he really meant it, and that Paul wants to push us towards unity, that we might not always see things perfectly, but our answer shouldn't be enmity, strife, division, but unity. The last one, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Wild parties. Excessive living. My escape rather than God's significance. Where in my life have the struggles and the tensions and the battle become so difficult that I would rather just escape, even if it's just 20 minutes or an hour or two hours? God has placed us on this earth and put us in jobs and in neighborhoods for, for incredible significance. To, to enter into the brokenness of our world. And when we move away and we say, no, I just want to escape for this time. And I'm not talking, uh, there's a need to escape and be healthy from time to time. Introvert, extrovert, all of that is good and proper. But when we continually make a habit where our desire is to escape from the realities of the significance of life, we are walking in the flesh. What do we do? How do we respond? Whether it's, Maybe you're feeling guilt and you think, wow, Scott, thanks for the guilt fest this morning. And maybe it's indifference. Maybe you're sitting here this morning thinking, you know what? If you knew me, you would know I'm a pretty good person. Like I, my sin is kind of in check and now things are going well. How do we respond? What do, what do we do? Is, is it that we should try harder, create better rules? Some of us have tried that. Uh, sh should we just go after our preferences? If we could just do our preferences, then we would be able to finally walk in the spirit as we've been instructed. Regardless of where you are and regardless as you take your own personal inventory, here's the reality for each of us. Jesus pursues you in your messed up state. Jesus entered into this world and Jesus died on the cross for you and for I while we were still sinners. And Jesus demonstrates that even through communion as we think about communion. He says, I pursued you to the point of my death. So as you take bread and drink juice, remember, this is how much I love you. You see, our goal and our aim isn't the list. The list is helpful. The list is important. But our goal and aim is Christ, to know Christ and to know the love of Christ and to say, I so desperately want that love and grace to just impact the entire world around me. Galatians 5.24, a couple of verses down, says this, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The sin has been dealt with. We do communion as, as, a, as a way to remember, and as a way to celebrate what has been done for us, that through repentance of our sin, new life and freedom is possible. And as we enter into this time to observe the Lord's table in light of the passage that we just read, I think it's important for us to do this in a spirit of reflection, to consider that list and to consider the ways in which we 
are guilty of, of walking in the flesh. So I'm going to invite the musicians and the ushers forward at this time. Twenty-eight says it this way. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And I want to create a space for us each to do that. Uh, to, to consider where in our lives confession is necessary, where in our lives repentance is necessary, and where in the, in the lives of, of each of us that we need Christ to just to show up, to, to intercede, to, to do something here this morning in our lives. Uh, this is an open communion table, meaning you don't need to be a member of Calvary Church, but you do need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ uh, as your Lord and Savior. Uh, and again, uh, use the time as, as the elements are being handed out and as the words are being sung to reflect and to consider. Let me pray for the bread. Lord, I pray the Psalms. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Father, thank you that a while we were still sinners, you died for us. In our messed up state, you pursued us to the point of your body being pierced so that we can have life and freedom. Thank you for the bread. Thank you for the symbol of your body broken for us. Amen. At this time, the, the bread will be distributed and we'll wait to partake together. Yeah. God is greater far than time. goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest star. The guilty man bowed down with care. God gave his son to me. His every child he reconciled and pardoned
on the night when Jesus was betrayed, just several hours before the whole process of his death, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this body, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup. And he tells us that this is not just in remembrance, it's also a proclamation. A proclamation to ourselves of the forgiveness that God has offered us, a proclamation to the world of what Jesus has done. Let's take a moment and thank God for the cup. God, as we recognize what your death and resurrection has accomplished for our behalf, forgiveness of our sins, washing us white as snow, providing a way for forgiveness and entering into relationship with you, we ask that you would fill us with gratitude as we remember your death and all that it's accomplished for us. Even this prayer, we pray in Jesus' name because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Amen.
writes that in the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. With gratitude, let's drink together. Communion is such a wonderful picture, such a great symbol of God's love for us. In light of of the flesh, in light of our own struggle, in light of our guilt, our, our, our sense of indifference, communion is that place where we remember that God poured out his love for each one of us to be freed up from the enslavement of sin and, and the fear of death. But, but this morning, I want to ask this question to, to end here in our time together. How? Like, how does that happen? How do, we, how do we actually walk by the Spirit? And you might be there thinking, like, well, Scott, if you knew some of the things I'm struggling with, like, I, I just don't know if, if you know how deep it goes. And that you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been guilty of. And, and it's going to look different for everybody. But I still think there's some things that we can take away. And, and what I want to do is just share a little bit of my own messy journey. And so... Uh, I became a follower of Christ when I was 18. Before I was a follower of Christ, I was an angry person. Uh, it didn't take me much through the sports I played and through school. I, I could probably bring some school teachers up from like 11th and 12th grade who would be like, I can't believe you're preaching. Uh, it really took very little for me to just begin shouting matches with people, uh, even over things that I didn't care. It was just the disagreement. It was like sport for me. And even then, before Christ was a part of my life, like I knew, they were, it was evident to me that this wasn't helpful. There were times where I would regret it instantly. There were times I would say things to people who I actually liked, but my tongue would be so quick that I would regret it as soon as the words were out. So even before that, and then as I was introduced to Christ, there wasn't this single moment that I could look back to where everything changed. Suddenly, everything got better. But there were still these moments where I would respond in anger to someone or something, and I'd say to myself, the battle would start. Like, I shouldn't have done that. Like, that was really dumb. Like, why isn't this Christ thing working? And then there was times where I'd make a good choice, and I would, you know, feel good about myself for a few minutes, but that often didn't always last. For me, this is a few things that I learned is what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? What does it mean to, to yield to the Spirit and to embrace God's way? For, for the, the first thing that began to change in me is the way I saw Jesus. Uh, I didn't really like church people at the time. I thought they were kind of all hypocrites. So being around church people was, was tricky for me. But one of my friends said, listen, just read about Jesus. Just understand his character, understand his mercy and his grace and his love. And I began to read scripture and I began to see something that began to change my mind and change my heart. And I realized like, like if everyone lived even like 10% of what Jesus taught, this world would be incredible. And then there was this promise of like eternal relationship with God. And I thought this is incredible as well. So I began to study the Bible. I didn't even know how to study the Bible. I just started reading Genesis 1. And, you know, that somebody helped me then later to know. Maybe start later. Accountability began to help. I started to change who I was hanging out with on a regular basis. Prior to Christ, I was hanging around with a lot of other angry people. Our anger took different expressions and different bad choices, but we were always kind of getting ourselves in trouble. And I began to spend more time with people who seemed to have, like, some of their anger worked out. Like, there were times where people should have gotten angry, and they didn't, and it puzzled me. I was like, how did you do that? Like, you should have, like, punched that guy, but you didn't. Like, what's that about? And be like, well, you know, like, it's not me, it's not for me to judge, and that was disrespectful, but I still love that person. I was like, that's incredible. I want that in my life, because that's real freedom. 
You're not controlled then by people responding to you one way or another. I began to sit in church to attempt to soak in truth and God began to change my life and the anger in my life. But let me let you in on a little secret. Some of you, this might burst your bubble. Today, I'm an angry person. Like today, there are times when people say things or when things happen that I just get angry. You know who I get angry with? God. Like I go, God, if, if you're so powerful and loving, why did you let that happen? Or there's times with my kids or my wife, my, my tongue just still gets me in trouble. And so it's a process and I'm learning. And part of it for me in this journey and where I'm at currently, it's just sort of knowing myself a little bit. Where, you know, like I talked about the car earlier and the indicator light comes on. That's the very moment where the yielding to the spirit matters most. So for me, when I start getting agitated with things that shouldn't be agitating me, so let's say something happened four days ago and had no effect on me, and the same thing happens today, but now I'm just, what is going on? What is wrong? I can't believe this. That's my indicator light to say, now is the time you need to yield to the spirit. You're getting angry over something that's pretty dumb. And those are the moments for whatever it is you're dealing with, you have to identify those things. When is it late at night or what kinds of people that you get surrounded by that kind of moves you towards idolatry or enmity or strife? And what are those lights for you? And knowing where those lights come in and when those lights come to say, your ways, not my ways, I want to yield to the Spirit. So I want to leave you with this question. Will you will to will the will of God. A bit complicated, I know, kind of a clumsy sentence. It's not original to me. But as you see God and as you fall in love with his character and as you see his grace and his mercy, and are we willing to ask ourselves the question, like, who am I following? The way of the world or myself or my own moral compass? Will you will to will the will of God? And the reason I ask it this way, Matthew 6, 10, Jesus prays this, the common prayer most of us know. Your kingdom come, Jesus praying to God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done. It's an incredibly easy prayer to pray, but an incredibly difficult prayer to live out, that God's will would rule over all of the other battles going on internally. That, God, there's times where I don't want your will. Would you help me will to will your will in my life? Because sometimes the sin, it entices. And sometimes I I just give in. But Spirit, would you lead me to a place where I would be open to your will? Because I think most of us would agree that God through the cross is a good and loving and gracious Father. He has our best interest in mind. And so while we might not always want to give it up, and while we might want to move back into enslavement, It's only Christ that offers freedom and liberation. And I do want God's will more than anything else, even when I struggle to will it. So this morning, I want to end with a little bit of like a a choose your own prayer based on where you might be this morning. I think some of you here are here this morning and you may be feeling an incredible sense of guilt in light of communion and in light of your sin. But you might be here saying, I'm done with it. Like, I am ready to change. And your prayer might be, I I want your will for my life, Jesus. I I want to know the grace and the mercy and the love of God. Please show me and help me to know it. Philippians 2.13 says this, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I love that. I love that it's not based on me. I love that I'm free to pursue Christ and to invest in this world because his will and and it's him working in and through me. And so it's my yielding to the spirit that brings transformation in my life. Another prayer that some might pray this morning. Some are caught in sin, but you're hearing all my words and you're moved with incredible indifference. It's not that big a deal. It doesn't really matter. It's not hurting anyone. Would you be willing to at least pray like, Lord, I want your will in my life even when I'm feeling selfish. I want your righteousness, 
but I don't want to give it up right now. Could you change my will? Could you change the things that I will for my life to be more of the things you will for my life? Christ, your will be done. The final group that might be praying this morning is, Father, thank you. Thank you that I've come out or through seasons of difficulty. Thank you that I am walking step by step in the Spirit. Would you please help me to continue to do that? Would you please help me to stay committed to being in step and walking with the Spirit? Regardless of where you are, I think 2 Timothy 2.22 has something to say for each of us. So flee youthful passions. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who have called on the name of the Lord from a pure heart. Some of us need this reminder to just flee. When the the temptations in the flesh come, flee. But don't just flee. Don't just try to manage sin. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and do it alongside of others who are going to help point you in the right direction, and you're all pointing to Christ together. Regardless of what you prayed, we want to celebrate. We want to rejoice. We want to rejoice in the fact that of the amazing love of Jesus, our Messiah, our Redeemer, that our very lives have been bought with a price and his spirit lives in us, compelling, causing, and changing us each and every day that we don't have to allow sin to have free reign, but instead allow God's spirit to truly reign in our lives. Would you stand and join us together? sing out together as God's people. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become His righteousness. He humbled Himself and carried the cross. Love so
Thank you so, so much for being here. Uh, the welcome gathering starts right now out any of those doors to your right. Also, lunch will begin in the fellowship hall. Uh, let me close in a word of prayer. Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us today, help us this week to will your will in our lives. Help us to walk by the Spirit in the freedom and the truth that it exists. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. Thanks so much for being here.